working together. Let's see. As I said, our relationships are very important. Um, many of several in this room I've worked together on with cases. Mike Collum, I've worked with him. I've worked with, of course, Bill Rex and the Philly Center, and of course, Mary. Mary has been my rock. Let me show you a quick little video and kind of get you going. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Tonight, 18 men stranded in the Baltimore Harbor. They're seafarers, seafarers rather, who make their living moving items around the globe on container ships. 90% of the goods traded around the world are delivered by international shipping industries. And abandoned crews and ships with nowhere to go is becoming a growing problem. Tonight in Focus, reporter Mallory Safaste talks to the men and the people making sure they don't go hungry. A one-day trip has turned into nearly two months for the 18-member crew of the new lead Granadino. The new lead Granadino is a tank ship that experienced an engine problem on its way to the U.S. When it got to the Port of Baltimore, the Coast Guard conducted a port state examination. We found some additional problems and they had to detain the vessel in the port. They can't leave until the engine is fixed and the men on board, most from the Philippines and without visas, aren't permitted to step on shore. Even if they could, leaving would mean forfeiting their pay. There's a lot of repairs that need to be done, and the company, New Lead, that owns and operates the vessel is having some financial difficulties, and they have all but abandoned the vessel. They can't afford to put the food and the water on board to take care of the men. The men have not received salaries in five months. With no place to go and repairs set to take several months and cost upwards of a million dollars, these men were left to fend on their own. That's where the International Transport Workers Federation comes in. Barbara Shipley is one of only about 140 inspectors around the world. They do routine inspections on ships, checking for humane conditions and that the seafarers are being paid. She was called in when problems were reported on the new lead Granadine. Okay, let's recap. We got 18 seafarers stranded in the harbor. Low provisions, no water in the tanks. These gentlemen had, had not had a bath in over two weeks. They have not been paid for months. Their ship is unseaworthy. They've been detained by the Coast Guard. If I'm allowed to say, they had 25 deficiencies, three detainables. Um, a lot of them didn't, they didn't have visas anymore. They were no longer allowed to go ashore. There again? No. And see what would happen. Like a prison. That would have felt like you felt like a prisoner? Yes. It's very hard. It was very hard for these gentlemen. It was very hard for me to see these gentlemen in this state. Um, so this all started, the pilots called the Coast Guard complaining, telling them, We've got a bad ship here. There's some things going on. The Coast Guard called myself, Barbara, we think we need you here. So I went on board and um, found the conditions. And my first thought was these gentlemen, they needed a lot of help. They were, they were really distraught. They were, they were broken. And, um, you know, I think their dignity and pride had been hurt. So my first call is, Mary, we have a problem. Please help me. Um, and this is when it got crazy, very quickly. Um, someone, not us, contacted the media, and we got bombarded with telephone calls. And the first thing we had to do was educate the press, tell them about seafarers' lives, tell them about you know, the 90% of shippers, you know, things coming into our country that the reporter had said. So we've got that pretty good. Uh, we got a good story out there. Then it got really crazy, <laughs> really crazy. How many hours were you on the phone together? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> a lot. Um, at that point, again, well, I want to go back and recap. It's all the relationships in the port that are coming together on this. The Coast Guard and the seafarer centers, the pilots were involved, eventually tugboat companies were involved, and the whole community. So our phones went crazy. We had someone, Mary had someone manning the telephones. They were literally handing us notes and we were stacking them up, prioritizing and going, who'd you talk to and what did you do? <laughs> so we've got all these donations, the whole community wants to help. Then we said, what do we do with all this stuff? Mary's like, we can't put it at my center, I don't have room. 
So we talked to my affiliate, the SIU, and they've opened the union hall. Great, we've got a place to store our things. Then we said, Mary, how do we get it to the ship? Mary says, I've got this. She has port partners and she knows her community very well. We've called the pilots first off. They got us out to visit the ship again because they were back at Anchorage. And then it went from there. We coordinated with Coast Guard on several things. We coordinated with... McAllister. McCall oh, McAllister. I haven't got there yet. <laughs> they were fabulous. Anything we needed, McAllister really stepped up and helped us. And that is through Mary's relationship with them. I mean, she, all of your relationships with your port partners is invaluable to cases like this. And working with other seafarer centers, we had um, the Stella Mars helped out. Bill Rex could be remiss without mentioning him. Um, Christmas time, he came down to our vessel, brought a Christmas tree and some Christmas gifts. So um, again, we just all worked together very hard, and um, we had a happy ending eventually. Let's see. Eventually. And Seafarer Center. I think it's really important for them to know that someone cares and that if additional needs develop, that they'll be able to reach out to us and we'll reach out to our supporters and do the best we can. I there you go, back to our port partners and working together, Mary reaching out. Um, but I want to talk about together with ITF and AMA, how we work together on, or how we work well together. Um, one of the things that when we find cases like this between the centers and the ITF and other people, we help restore dignity back to these seafarers. As Mary said, I don't think it was in this clip, maybe another one on the news, she said, um, you know, these sailors are not looking up for a handout. They're looking for justice and a hand up. And that's what we provide for them. Um, we let them know, oh, I'm sorry. There we go, <laughs> I missed one. We let them know um, that we, they're worthy. They, they can believe in themselves again, and we renew self-pride. Through this, we build friendships, and we've learned lifelong friendships, which these friendships, again, provides enthusiasm to help them do their job and um, come back to the ports and say, Mary, how are you? And uh, some of you others, you know these relationships. And the last thing that we do, really, is we help um, provide passion to the seafarers, and we all have a passion to help them and join together. I guess it's just a big family. Really, it is. And How happy these men are to be leaving behind the new lead, Granadino. The men are especially grateful for Barbara Shipley with the International Transport Workers Federation and Reverend Mary Davison of the Baltimore International Seafarer Center for coming to their aid when they were deserted and desperate. This crew has been amazing with the conditions that they've lived with and tolerated. It's just unbelievable. To, they've been so happy and they've been so positive and it's just, it's a great day coming. Thank you. It was a great day coming in. They were very happy and positive with the visits from Mary and myself throughout the nine months they were stuck in our port. Um, they left with more food than they could eat. They now had a TV. They now had a coffee pot. They now had a microwave. They had more microwave popcorn than they could ever eat in a year. <laughs> so um, thank you all very much. And just thank you again for your relationships with the ITF and um, being there for us as we are there for you. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm taking advantage of my position here with the mic to just add a few words from the point of view of the Seafarer Center to complement what Bobby said, and then um, we should still have a little time for questions regarding any of our three presentations. Um, it was a joy and an eye-opener for me to work with Barbara Shipley. I have just the level of her energy and her persistence going after this person and that company and sending emails around the clock was just amazing. And the depth of her knowledge of the industry. Um, so I could say a lot, but I'm just gonna make three short, short points about how this was for me as a center director. Um, the first, as, um, as Bobby, Barbara has 
uh, said very well already, it is so much about coordination and cooperation. Um, so just to take a small example, because I'm an example person, um, one of the things I learned early on was it wasn't necessarily the best thing for anyone who might know something about the vessel to call up somebody in the Coast Guard. So we established a routine where if I heard something from a seafarer that I thought maybe needed to go to the Coast Guard and it wasn't life and death in the next three minutes, I would get in touch with Bobby and she had regular connections with a particular person. And that just worked better than emails and phone calls all over the map. Um, the other side of coordination was coordinating with my wonderful team of volunteers who never made it into any of these videos, but while I was on the newly Granadino, they were taking care of all the other 2,000 crews that come into our port every year and all working extra hours. Also, have you ever tried to find 18 sets of long underwear in a Walmart the week before Christmas? Because <laughs> there he is, Bob. Bob was one of those. Several of our volunteers <laughs> were scouring you know, Walmart just, at least the Walmarts in Baltimore just looked like a train wreck at that time of year. Um, and the volunteer, and the guys had no heat at that point. So that was marvelous. Um, the second thing um, is confidentiality. I had dealt with a, um, some years back with some help from Doug with a vessel that had been arrested for like a couple of years. But for whatever reason, that did not get nearly the level of press attention. I guess partly because the new lead was anchored by the Key Bridge, which everyone in Baltimore drives over the Key Bridge so they would see it. Um, and yes, we wanted to use this opportunity, as Bobby said, make it a teachable moment. But at the same time, I found myself saying to some reporters, if I visited your brother in the hospital, would you want me to then have an interview with you and tell the whole world everything your brother said? I mean, there are things we just don't say to the press. So for example, when a reporter asked me, well, what were the men praying about? I said, well, I'm a chaplain, that's confidential. I'll tell you what I prayed about on their behalf. I prayed, as Bobby said, for justice. So that's something maybe to think about in advance if you're there and your phones are about to start ringing. We are not there to betray confidences, even if it would give us a lot of cool press. And the third thing related to that was teachable moments. Um, there are just so many things we had to explain. It's not necessarily good to go out to a full-size vessel that's at anchor in your cute little recreational boat and try and jump on board and rescue them or try and throw food on board. I mean, there was just some very basic stuff we had to teach. Um, seafarers may be having a hard time. That does not mean that they need your stale crackers and odd socks. Can we please? I, you laugh. Believe me, we got them. We, we, were, we were sorting food for like six hours one day and I was starving and I opened one of the boxes of crackers and I was really hungry and I could not eat those crackers. They were gross. And that's what some people thought it would be nice to give seafarers. Now, most people were very generous and discerning. But the other, uh, one other teachable moment, and then I'll stop. Um, but there were a lot. But one other that will sort of make you laugh and cry is we got phone calls close toward Christmas. This is so sad, how can we help this crew? They're not gonna be home for Christmas. And I realized, and that was very sad because a lot of them have been on board for a long time. But I realized that some of our callers apparently thought that shipping just stops in December and everyone goes home for Christmas or something. I mean, they were just shocked that this crew would not be home for Christmas. So we, we really tried. We did get some interest in volunteering and financial support out of this, but we, we had to teach that this is a, a long-term reality. It's more dramatic in the case of that one crew, but shipping goes on year-round, and it's always hard. Um, questions for any of our speakers?